Hey guys, so in this lesson we have must be true questions, which are the first of the question types that we're gonna be covering in this course. Yay, right? Like these guys, you're gonna to wanna to pick an answer choice that is proven 100% valid based off of the info you're given in your stimulus, AKA whatever answer choice you have picked has to be 100% valid based off of your evidence. No if, ands, or buts, your answer choice has to be proven valid, okay? These must be true questions mean business and their business is validity. So as always, we're gonna begin this lesson talking about the importance of must be true questions. Then we're gonna take a look at question stems, the structure of a must be true question, review validity and scope, and lastly, take a look at how must be true questions use causal and conditional reasoning to give you a headache. Let's get into it. So why is this lesson important? Why are we spending our time here? And for this lesson more specifically, why are we choosing to start with must be true questions of all the question types? Wouldn't it make sense to start with the assumption family or one of the bigger questions, okay? So to answer that, you have to understand must be true questions. You know, they account for about 4% of questions in a logical reasoning section. They're not a huge question type. And for that reason, most LSAT prep material kind of half asses them. And that's fine, as long as you don't want a 170, okay? Must be true questions, even though they only represent a tiny fraction of your logical reasoning section, actually are pretty tightly correlated to what score you get on test day. Back when I first started tutoring, I spent a lot of time trying to find patterns in my students. And because I was teaching classes rather than one-on-one, -on -one, I had access to actually a pretty large pool of students. What I found out is this, people who were unhappy with their logical reasoning scores almost always were doing poorly or at the least were inconsistent with their must be true scores. Okay, now why is that? Because must be true questions are testing you on some core concepts that are absolutely necessary to ACE's exam. These are gonna be validity, scope, conditional logic, and causation, okay? If you know these core concepts, you can eat up must be true questions for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if you don't know these core concepts, not only will you suck at must be true questions, you'll probably also suck at any question type that involves them, which is everything in this test. So, you know, that's why we start with these guys here. It's, it's really to hammer down these concepts. And if we're successful here, then your life is so much easier, not only with most of the other question types, but with the answer choices as well. So first up, how do we recognize these guys? Let's Pretty easy, actually. They stick out like a sore thumb. Almost always must be true question stems will have one of two, if not both of these elements. You start out with something telling you to assume that your stimulus is factual. That's gonna look like this. If the statements above are correct or the statements above if true, okay? Next, you'll have some clause talking about validity, probably in a funky way. Which one of the following must also be true or which one of the following conclusions can be properly inferred? So what can we do with that? What, what does that tell us? Well, let's start with the first statement in our stem. They tell you that you have to take something as true. What does that mean, LSAC? Okay, like as opposed to like all the other lies you're telling us? Actually, no. What it means is, hey, fellas, we're giving you pretty legit facts here. Don't be an idiot and contradict a fact. Don't be a bigger idiot and put words in the author's mouth either. Whatever is in your stimulus is, in the test writer's eyes, completely undeniable. It is factual. Do not try and add things, question things, subtract things, or anything like that. You just have to take the statements at face value, which is what most students probably fail to do, okay? If a student misses a must-be-true question, I feel like nine times out of ten, I can take a look at whatever answer choice they picked and find just one word in the stimulus or in the answer choice that if they had taken as a fact or read without bias, they would have gotten that question right. Just one word. That should tell you that with this question type, you need to be super detail focused. They're kind of like recognition or detail questions from the reading comprehension section. You're being tested on what was said, okay? So if we take a look at a few must be true question stems, they say things like this. If the statements above are correct, which one of the following must also be true, okay? That's pretty straightforward. Nothing there really to confuse you. It literally says must be true, but they can be trickier. Take a look at this one. Which one of the following can be properly inferred from the statements? So what's going on there is LSAT is testing the literal definition of the word inferred, which is pretty different from how we use inferred in day-to-day -day conversational life, okay? Personally, if someone came out to me on the street and used the word inferred, I think something is, what they're saying is likely or could be true. But when the LSAT says inferred, they mean something very specific. They mean which one of the following is valid, is proved. Don't screw that up. If they're saying something is inferred, they mean validity, something without exceptions. 
Next up, let's talk about the structure of a must be true question. They're actually pretty finicky because they show up completely different than your typical LR stimulus. Let's go over that real quick, okay? Your typical LR stimulus, say from an assumption or a flaw or a weakened question, has premises and it has a conclusion. They're called arguments, okay? We have a whole lesson on them. Must be true questions usually don't take that form. Instead, they take the form of a fact-based argument. Okay, what does that look like? Well, it's just a series of facts or statements, really. You don't have a premise, you don't have a conclusion, so you don't have any real kind of reasoning. Okay, sure, you know, your facts are going to be connected somehow, but they don't have to necessarily build on each other. Okay, check out this example here from practice test 37, section 2, question 2. Hey guys, in this part of the lesson, I'm working through a real LSAT question for the application. Okay, I'm not allowed to show you guys real LSAT questions. If you want to see the application of this, please join my course. The link is down below. Now, earlier in this lesson, I told you guys what must be true questions want you to do. They want you to pick an answer choice that's totally valid based on the stimulus. Roughly, there are four ways to do that, meaning there are four ways to prove an answer choice is definitely correct. The first one is going to be using common sense. In our logical reasoning intro video, we read through the instructions of the logical reasoning section. Based off of that, we're allowed to use common sense to assume things. Okay, again, that's, that's pretty basic stuff, like knowing that New York and Los Angeles are different cities. An example of that would be this. If I say the sky is blue, then a common sense assumption would be that the sky is not red or orange. What's common sense there? That red, orange, and blue are different colors, right? The second piece of info that you can use would be the statements from the stimulus. On easier must be true questions, your correct answer choice can literally just be paraphrasing of one of the sentences from the stimulus. Okay, that's that's completely fair game for this test, guys, for this question type. There's no reason to take things further or jump on an inference bandwagon immediately. Look for an answer choice that is just restating one of the facts. I don't know why, but but a lot of students think that you can't do that. You totally can paraphrase. If I have a statement saying that I have six daughters, six sons, and six ex-wives, and how can you paraphrase that? Number one, I'm bad at marriage, and I have a large family. Both of those statements are saying the same thing. If one is true, then the other is true, okay? The third is going to be statements that imply other statements, okay? And this one is actually probably so easy that it's hard, right? If I have a statement that says all animals hate wintertime, what can I conclude? What can I infer based on that? I can conclude that foxes hate wintertime, bears hate wintertime, salmon hate wintertime. All of those have to be true. Why? Because I say all in my statement. Not some, not many, not most. I say all. And if all animals hate winter, then any animal I can list must also hate winter. Okay? Number four is combining statements. If I say all Americans like McDonald's and Alex is an American, then I can combine those two statements and say Alex likes McDonald's, which is a fact. I do like McDonald's, right? Everything here is a valid way of approaching must be true questions. Your stimulus can do any of the four, okay? Pattern recognition is so important for these question types. And for that reason, it's so important to make sure that you know and understand how different inferences make sense. So next up, let's do a little review of validity. We had a whole lesson on validity before this, so if you feel like this is something that you're struggling with, definitely please go back and watch that lesson. We make it you know, pretty super clear there, right? Validity is basically the strongest form of support. It is when something is 100% certain. Now, please remember from that lesson the difference between validity and truth. Truth deals with statements. A sentence can be truthful. The earth is round is true. The sky is blue is true. My name is Alex is true. Apples are turquoise is not true. That would be a cool apple though, right? Validity deals with arguments. You need to support something in order for it to be valid. None of the statements in my truth example just a second ago had any kind of support. They're just factual or unfactual. Validity looks like this. All fish swim in water. A salmon is a fish. Therefore, salmon swim in water. We have support here and here. Each of the statements individually is true, but it's the argument that is valid, okay? What you wanna be doing in must be true questions is this. One or all of your statements in your must be true stimulus is going to act as support towards a statement in your answer choices. When put together, your stimulus and your answer choices, they are valid, meaning that whatever you're picking in your stimulus, whatever you're picking your answer choices is 100% backed up, okay? And that actually makes our lives so much easier. Why? Because it sets the bar for LSAT so high. 
If whatever answer choice you pick is just 1% wrong, then it can't be right. And it also means that you can truly actually double check your answer in must be true questions. Based off of what I said a minute ago about your stimulus acting as support for your answer choice, you should be able to actually go back and look at your stimulus and highlight whatever your support is once you've picked an answer choice. If when put together, they're valid, then you have the correct answer. If not, time to go back to the drawing board. Let's, took an ex let's look at an example on how to prove that. It's from practice test 37, section two, question seven, and it says, hey guys, in this part of the lesson, I'm working through a real LSAT question for the application, okay? I'm not allowed to show you guys real LSAT questions. If you wanna see the application of this, please join my course, the link is down below. Next up, we have the concept of scope, okay? Scope is how far into the topic does your stimulus go? Now, this part is important because out-of-scope answer choices are probably the most prevalent wrong answer choice on the entire test. What scope comes down to is the idea of relevancy versus relatedness. Something can either be related to your stimulus or it can be relevant to your stimulus. Something relevant serves a purpose, whereas something related does not. It's very important to understand the difference. If I have these series of facts, I have a motorcycle, I have a helmet, I have a motorcycle jacket, I don't have motorcycle insurance. All of my statements here are about having the necessary equipment to go out motorcycling. Whether or not I have a motorcycle license is immaterial, right? Whether I like to go motorcycling is not, it's just related. Why? Because my enjoyment never comes into play here. It's only about whether or not I have the required equipment. You don't have to enjoy something to have the equipment. Tons of people have New York City subway passes. Does that mean they enjoy riding the subway? No, probably not. That would be falling for an out of scope trap. You're taking things too far. A lot of the times the test charges will take advantage of that in a pretty obvious yet hard to see way. So think about it like this. In day-to-day -day conversation, we're taught to expand and contribute to conversations. To further a conversation, you know, like if, if I say I like cheesecake, you'd probably think what flavors or I like cheesecake too. On the outside, it's not, it's not a two-sided conversation. Furthering that conversation that the stimulus is giving you is actually just you expanding the scope. It's you putting words in the author's mouth. So they're trying to take advantage of how you're trained to think and to speak in normal everyday scenarios to get you to miss these points. So now that we've identified that, how do we avoid it? Explicitly define the scope of whatever you read. It's good practice, not just for must be true questions, but for every single question in logical reasoning and RC. If you're looking to add to the stimulus, you will always get the question wrong. So now we have conditional logic. Because of the nature of these must be true questions, conditional logic fits so perfectly within them, okay? And that's also true, by the way, of sufficient assumption questions, which are gonna be covered in a much later lesson, okay? For now, let's review conditional logic, okay? Conditional logic is when we take the statement, if A, then B, right? This should be all review for you guys. We covered conditional logic really in depth a few lessons ago. Within our statements, if A, then B, we have two elements. We have the sufficient and necessary conditions. A here is our sufficient condition. What he's doing is guaranteeing something. Our sufficient condition is sufficient. It is enough to guarantee that the necessary condition occurs. B is our necessary condition. The necessary condition is required in order for our sufficient condition to be true, okay? Then we have our contrapositive, which is just the flip and negation of our original conditional statement. So if A then B turns into, if not B, then not A, okay? We have two basic inferences that can be made based off of the setup. First is modus ponens, which is when we have premise one, if A then B, premise two, we have A, what's the valid inference from that? B. Then we have modus tollens, where you still have premise one, if A then B, but now premise two is not B. So our valid inference then is not A. Both of these setups are prime candidates for must be true questions. Why? Because they both guarantee something. They guarantee the necessary condition. If you have a conditional on one premise, then another premise that says, hey, I have my sufficient condition, then you can validly conclude that you have your necessary condition. Likewise, if you have a conditional in one premise, then another premise that says, I don't have the necessary condition, then you can validly conclude that you don't have the sufficient condition. Both of these conclusions are valid and thus you can use them on must be true questions. So let's look at an example from practice test 36. It's section one, question 11. 
Hey guys, in this part of the lesson, I'm working through a real LSAT question for the application, okay? I'm not allowed to show you guys real LSAT questions. If you wanna see the application of this, please join my course, the link is down below. So now last but not least, we have comparative reasoning, okay? Comparisons show up in about 20% of must be true questions, but also in a lot of flaw and weakened questions, which are your biggest questions on test day. Working causation and must be true questions helps you build this skill because typically the way comparisons are tested in must be true questions is via absolutes, okay? So it makes these comparisons really, really easy to spot if you know what you're looking for, all right? You can make them easier here and master comparative reasoning without all of the weird tricks and traps that show up in other question types, okay? These comparisons involve a lot of more and less statements. Let's take, let's take a look at one, okay? Let's say I have two people, Justin and Marcus, okay? Justin has two times more roommates than Marcus, and Justin's house is 50% the size of Marcus's house. What can we definitely say based off of this? Well, we can say that Justin's and roommates per room ratio is definitely higher than Marcus's, right? They're crammed in there. Usually in comparisons, you have two different things compared. Number one, you can have two things compared at the same point in time, such as in this example we have here with Justin and Marcus. Or we can have one thing compared at two different points in time. We can compare Justin today and Justin five years ago. Both of these are essentially doing the same thing. Instead of Justin versus Marcus, you have Justin versus old Justin, okay? Let's take a look at an example of how they do this. This one is from practice test two. It's an oldie, right? Section four, number 23. Hey guys, in this part of the lesson, I'm working through a real LSAT question for the application, okay? I'm not allowed to show you guys real LSAT questions. If you wanna see the application of this, please join my course, the link is down below. So causation is another core skill typically found in must be true questions that really helps you in the more prevalent question types. We had earlier in this course, a pretty thorough lesson covering causation, along with the difference between causation and conditional logic, okay? It's pretty simple. Essentially causation is when you have two entities, again, we'll call them A and B, and you have one causing the other to occur. The big difference with causation versus conditional logic has to do with chronology. Within conditional logic, you're only seeking to guarantee something occurred, but the sufficient condition doesn't have to cause your necessary condition to occur. And we even saw an example where our necessary condition actually occurred before the sufficient condition, okay? In causation, you're having a direct chain. Something is directly causing something else to occur and your effect obviously has to happen after your cause, okay? So we have a more recent example here. We've got practice test 65, section four, question six. Hey guys, in this part of the lesson, I'm working through a real LSAT question for the application, okay? I'm not allowed to show you guys real LSAT questions. If you wanna see the application of this, please join my course, the link is down below. So now we're gonna wrap this lesson up with a chat about language and how it can make must be true questions really suck, okay? This is gonna tie back to our modifiers lesson where we talked about adjectives. In that lesson, I made a big fuss about how modifiers can completely change the meaning of a sentence. Within must be true questions, that's really, really relevant. A lot of the time in must be true questions, the devil's in the details. If you're doing a review of your must be true problem sets or a practice test or an LR section, and you're saying, hey, I'm getting a lot of these questions wrong. Look in your answer choice and see, are you missing details? Are you misreading words? Are you just glossing over things? If you are, please, please, please do us both a favor and go back to my modifier session. It will really help you. Okay, so that's the end of our must be true lesson. That's the first question type that we're gonna be covering in this. It's the head of the quote unquote formal logic question type family. And we start with must be true questions because they cover so many different core concepts that are tested in both logical reasoning, RC, and then also a little bit in, in logic games with the conditional logic, okay? So this is an important lesson. Please, please, please do not make the mistake of glossing over must be true questions. It really is an important question type, even though it's only tested a little bit the concepts underneath it that must be true allows you to perfect because of that high bar they set are invaluable in your path to getting a 180, okay? So I'll see you guys in the next lesson. I hope you enjoyed this one.